Hello and welcome to Announcing the Game, where professional public address announcers share their expertise and best practices to help to make you a better public address announcer. I'm Tom Winicky. I've announced at the high school level at Fayetteville Manlius High School in New York State, as well as many Section 3 championships in New York State at different sports over the years. I also announce at the college level at Syracuse University of the Atlantic Coast Conference and at Colgate University of the Patriot League. I've even been able to announce international competition in women's basketball and women's ice hockey at the inaugural Aurora Games in 2019. I also announced the New York State Public High School Athletic Association state championships for girls lacrosse and for football. And I'm also the National Association of Sports Public Address Announcers Announcer of the Year for 2017. Today, we'll talk about announcing football, either at the high school or the college level. Now, don't worry if you announce games for Pop Warner or for flag football. Much of what we go over here will be directly applied to the games that you announce as well. We'll go over things that you can do to prepare for a football game, both before you ever set foot on the game site, as well as how to best prepare once you're there. We'll talk about how best to handle situations as they come up during a game. Things like how to announce each play, how to handle things like special teams, turnovers, and penalties. We'll even talk about other promotions that could go on during your game. And to wind things up, we'll go over a few ways to wrap up a game. So let's get started. Like all of the sports that we announce, so much of our game's success is predicated on our pregame preparation. And by pregame, I mean what we do before the game. But more importantly, it's what we do before we ever set foot at the game site. We'll talk about what you can do before arriving at the game and then what you can do once you're there to make your job easier and more effective. Now that includes both interacting with teams and the officials. Football is unique and that you need to be talking every 30 to 45 seconds. You'll need to have your resources organized in such a way that you can correctly identify who ran or caught the ball and where they were stopped, how many yards were gained or lost, who made the tackle, and what's the next down and distance. If it was a pass, was it incomplete? Who was in on the coverage? We'll talk about this later. We'll then move on to what and how to say what happened after each play and how to do all of that before the offense breaks the huddle for the next play. We'll go over announcing penalties, both if the officials are miked or not. Talk to any football coach and they'll universally say how important special teams are. Well, we'll show you an easy way to calculate the length of a punt or a punt return, as well as how to acknowledge a few other players on special teams besides just the kicker or the returner. Also, halftime is a built-in time for other production to happen. Will a band perform? Is a local Pop Warner or flag football group scrimmaging at halftime? Will the cheerleaders have a routine? Are you expected to be part of that or not? And we'll go over that later. The rules in any sport, well, they're always evolving, football included. Now, you and I, as top-notch public address announcers, need to be up to date on any rule changes. For the high school level, a quick search of the nfhs.org website will list any rule changes. Now, they may not pertain to us per se, but others might. Now, one high school example for 2023 is that offensive holding is no longer marked off from the spot of the foul. It's now marked off from the previous line of scrimmage. Now, this is something you can easily add to your announcement after the administration by an official of a holding penalty. For college football, a search of NCAA.org, not NCAA.com, will give you any rule changes for that current year. Now again, by being aware of these resources, you can better prepare yourself in the event that a new rule change is applied in the game that you're announcing. Also, it's a good idea when you sit down with your high school's athletic director or head coach, 
or the sports information director at the college level to ask about any new rules that you as the public address announcer just need to know about. Let's get into some specifics to help you in your preparation for football. Luck favors the prepared. Branch Rickey of the Brooklyn Dodgers said that luck is the residue of design. And you've heard me say before that my dad always said that he'd rather be lucky than good. So what's first on your preparation to-do list? Well, a good place to start is with a roster. For high school, is there a central place where you can get all these rosters online? Even better, but a bit more time consuming, is to call directly to the school's athletics director. They or their secretary can often send you a copy of the roster that you're looking for. Now, be sure to ask for it to be sorted numerically. An alphabetical roster or one organized by positions is just useless to us. It needs to be sorted numerically. And now while you have these people on the phone, ask once you get the roster if you can call them back so you can read through it with them so you're sure of the pronunciations. Now, if the secretary or the athletic director isn't sure of somebody's name, ask if you can get in contact with the head coach. Now, if they're not in the habit of giving out phone numbers, ask if they could send this coach a message with your contact information so they can get in touch with you. If you're in the school system and both of you are teachers in the same building, well, that's easy. Find them before school or find them at lunch. Set up any kind of meeting like this before the season starts, because once the games begin, coaches get very busy and are understand understandably harder to connect with. Plus, it's just a courtesy on our part to do this before the season begins. Now, I do just that. I call coaches when I prep for the state finals up here in New York. I start with a phone call to the school's athletic department, and they can usually help me with the names. If they're not sure, then they direct me to that head coach that I said I would contact, or they contact me. Then they're always to a person. They're very appreciative of my efforts to take this extra step to get their kids' names pronounced correctly. For visiting teams, if a roster isn't available online, your athletic department may have a copy that they'll use for a game day program. Just ask for one. If not, give that visiting school a call at least a week before the game for a roster. And just like with a home team, ask to call them back so you can read through the roster with them so you know you have all the names down pat. Now, if these ideas don't pan out for you, well, as long as you're at the game site at least an hour to an hour and a half before game time, an assistant coach can go over those rosters with you without rushing through so they feel like they need to be on the field for warm-ups. As a general rule, I try to stay away from head coaches on game day. They've got enough on their minds already. If the assistant sends me to a head coach, well, then I'll talk to them, but I'll always start with an assistant. Now, many high school players play both offense and defense, so there's no real advantage to trying to create a roster for offense and a separate one for defense. We'll talk more about that when we talk about college rosters. But when you talk to these coaches with pronunciations, you can also ask them questions like, who's the punter or the place kicker? Who's the kick returner? Who's the holder for your PATs? What about the long snapper? Who will get the bulk of the carries or the catches? Is there anyone on defense that will get a lot of tackles? Now, you're not asking for this information as a spy to give to your head coach of the home team. You're just using it so you can make some notes on your roster so you're better prepared to call these players' names when they make those plays. So when you're preparing for college games, start with a call to the sports information director for football. You can find them on the school's athletics directory under athletic communications. Set up a time to read through the roster with them. And don't forget to ask about hometowns also, in case that's a part of the way that they want their starters introduced. Now, one other suggestion. You may see pronunciation guides tacked onto a roster. Don't rely solely on these printed pronunciation guides. They're not always reliable. I've seen them printed only in lowercase letters with no emphasis shown for certain syllables. 
That's why I stress actually talking to somebody for this. For example, with my name, Winicky, if it's displayed all in lower case, win a key, you don't know what syllable to emphasize. The correct way would be the first syllable in capital letters, Winicky. Now at this level, I found that trying to work off of one roster of both teams, it's just too difficult. Teams may have up to or over a hundred players on a roster. Trying to pick a name out of a hundred on a page of paper is just too hard when you need to do it instantly. For me, the print is just too small. And what about duplicate numbers? If there are two number 11s on the roster and one makes a catch, if you're working off of just one main roster, how do, can you instantly tell which name to announce? You can't. So I'll create a roster for offense and a separate roster for defense for both teams. Now let me show you how I do that. Do the steps of creating an offensive roster and a defensive roster. This works especially well for college teams that may have a hundred or more players on a roster and have duplicate numbers. One number 12 might be on offense and there'll be a second number 12 on defense. And this will take care of that for you. So what this is, is a copy of a roster that I've copied and pasted from a college team that I'll announce their games for. And I've sorted the columns in the way I would read them for starting lineups. So I reorganize the columns to say, starting a quarterback, a six foot two inch freshman from Carmel, Indiana, number one, Zach Osborne. And it makes it easy for me to read right from left to right instead of jumping around from column to column. You can see these ear icons here. What this school has done has posted audio files of each student athlete saying their own name in their own hometown. And what this allowed me to do was to paste in the phonetics for the names I need a little help with to make sure I pronounce them correctly. Now let's show you how to make an offensive and defensive roster. You can see next to the positions here in column A, I've typed a one and a two, a two for defensive players, a defensive lineman, a defensive back, another defensive back, a linebacker down here, and a defensive back. I've typed number ones next to the offensive players, a quarterback, a wide receiver, a running back, and such. So what I'll do now is I'll select the entire roster and then I'll tell the spreadsheet to sort things. I'm working with the data and I'm gonna tell it to sort the data. And I'll tell it first, I wanna sort by the position numbers. So I tell it to sort by column A. Then I also want it to sort by the uniform numbers. So I say, after you do the positions, I want you to sort the uniform numbers, which is column F. Then I say, okay. Now I have all the ones on the top and all the twos on the bottom. All the numbers are organized numerically. All the offensive players from one to 98 and the defensive players from zero to the bottom. So that first step is done. Then I'll select just the offensive players, all the ones I've labeled number one. I'll copy it and then I'll paste it into the next tab, which I've labeled home offense. Now, when I do that, I don't need their height, their grade in school, or their hometowns anymore. So I delete those columns after I paste it in, and I have this, their number and their name and their positions if I need it. And I've labeled it home offense. Then I'll go back to that same roster. And instead of selecting the offense, I'll select the defense from zero down to 99. You see I've left the special teams players off and I'll talk about them in a second. Now I will copy these and then I'll paste them into the home defense and after I paste it I'll delete their height, their grade in school, and their hometown and it looks like this. So I have the defense sorted numerically, I have their positions if I want them, and their names typed down. Then what I'll do is the same thing for our opponent. I'll take their offense and defense and I'll follow those same steps. I won't have to show you here, but it's the same exact steps, just with a different roster. Then what I will do 
is I'll paste in the home offense and the guest defense on the same page. And it looks like this. So when the home team is on offense, these are the names I'm concerned with. And when they're on offense, our guests, the opponent, is on defense. Which allows me to quickly say, running back number three, Jaden Henry gets the carry. So, Henry, number three on the carry, brought down by Fletcher, number 12. Just by quickly going back and forth, I can eyeball who's carrying it or who makes a tackle. If the quarterback throws a pass, I could see that 11 is the quarterback and he completed it to 18. Phrase pass complete to CK, brought down by Hooker. The safety made the tackle just by going back and forth. Now I don't have to search, search through a whole roster with a hundred or more names on it. I can just quickly go back and forth. Now what you see at the bottom of the offense, this is where I put the special teams. So if the offense doesn't convert on third down and they're punting, I know to look for number 36, Pruitt, or maybe number 97, Eldridge. If they're attempting a field goal, I know to look for 48, Jaworski, or number 90, Bisco, or maybe it's 97, Eldridge, but it gives me a heads up on who to look for. If I want to announce who the long snapper is, I can do that, and that's all available for me. Then I'll do the same thing when the home team is on defense and our opponent is on offense. Here's the defense, I pasted it in, and next to it I pasted in our guest's offense. So I can say who, makes the, who gets the carry, or who catches the pass, or through the pass, who made the tackle or if there's a fumble or an interception, I can find their number and name here quickly and announce the correct names. This just makes it easier than sorting through an entire roster of 100 or more names trying to figure out duplicate numbers. Plus, this lets me print it larger and it's just easier for me to see. If this isn't to your liking, you can also find a blank roster sheet as well as one for starting lineups and a game tracking sheet on our website at publicaddressannouncer.org. Scroll down the main page until you see Forms. Click on that red icon to see what's there. See what looks like an easy one for you to start using. Now, you may already have one that you use, or one of these ideas may give you an idea on how you can tweak that form that you use now to make it work better. The point is that this tutorial help you develop something that makes you better prepared as a PA announcer for football. Now for college rosters, I'll ask those same questions I ask the high schools. Who's the punter or place kicker or the kick returner? Who's the holder or the long snapper on field goals or extra points? Who should I watch out for on offense or defense? Again, just to give you a bit of a heads up when announcing the game. You have your rosters all set up and ready to go. Next, when during pregame do you introduce the starting lineups? So who do you turn to to find out? At the high school level, start with the athletics director. Now they may defer to the head coach on this, but always start with the AD. Are the starters introduced individually or will the team all run out together? If you're sent to the home team's head coach for the starters, I like to give them the option of, of introducing offense or defense. It's their home game after all. Let them choose what they want to do. Then our guests just do the opposite. Now what I found to be successful is the first have the pregame clock set to go to zero at least 10 minutes before the scheduled game time. That gives me enough time to introduce the starters, play the national anthem, and since both teams are now at their sidelines, it now allows the officials to eas easily gather both teams for a sportsmanship talk, collect the captains for both teams, and take them out to midfield, administer the coin toss all before the scheduled game time. Now, it's imperative that you take the initiative to meet with the officials well during pregame to go over this, so they know when you start announcing and when they can begin their duties so the game goes off on time. Now, I will offer this schedule to the officials when I meet to them. It lets them know that I'm taking into consideration what they need to get done, as well as what I need to get done during pregame. But I will always defer to how they want to handle the pregame schedule. It's their game to officiate, so I let them ultimately decide. 
Especially with more and more high school games now being televised, it's doubly important to have this pre-game routine timed out. Something else to check on at the high school level is what's set for halftime. Is there a band? Are you announcing that? Or is somebody else doing that? Is there a Pop Warner or a flag football scrimmage scheduled at halftime? Are there scripts for that? Are the cheerleaders going through a routine at halftime? Now, I've read on various public address announcer groups online that often we get rosters at the last minute. They're alphabetical instead of numerical. Some I've even said that they get handwritten rosters. And I've also read where you get asked at the last minute to announce a senior day or a band at halftime or call a halftime scrimmage, but they don't bother to give you any scripts. My advice? Be proactive. Ask ahead of time if the game has something else going on at halftime and if you are expected to be a part of it or not. If you are, ask for a script and do this well enough in advance so you can get it, read it, and offer up any suggestions that you feel will make it read better. Yes, you are asking someone to do some work for you, but these are the same people that will want this event to go off without a hitch. You as the announcer never want to be caught <gasps> off guard. Remember, luck is the residue of design. These people will appreciate your help preparing. At the college level, go to your marketing department. They create the scripts and timesheets. So ask for these ahead of time. Now that gives you the opportunity to rehearse them and figure out how to best to use your voice inflection to make each read effective, to make them sound as genuine as possible. After all, a piece about a copy about being aware of your nearest exit in case of an emergency would sound very different than one about a current on-field promotion and somebody's trying to win a prize. You could also ask them how they want you to coordinate with any video being shown. For starting lineups, for example, are they putting up headshots for each starter? And in what order do they want to do that? Is that order printed out for you? What information on each player do they want announced? Find this information out ahead of time. I found personally that saying it in this order, position, height, grade in school, hometown, number, and then name just rolls off my tongue well. Saying, for example, starting a guard, a six foot five inch senior from Orchard Park, New York, number 67, Bruce Becker. Now that just sounds right. It sounds rhythmic. It doesn't sound disjointed and it lets me emphasize their name at the end. Let's see what your marketing department prefers though. They write the scripts. You read what they write. As for the visiting lineups, the way I see it, they deserve my respect whether it's high school, college, Pop Warner, flag football, or something else. When I introduce visiting teams lineups, it's done professionally. They practice no matter what the weather also. They watch film too. They run and lift just like the home team. When I call their lineups, I do it with something I call respectful enthusiasm. When do you announce the starters? Well, we already went over some ideas for a high school game, but what about college? Does marketing or the team, do they want the starters called out individually? Then the team collects on the sideline right before the start of the game. Or do they want the starters announced well before game time, possibly during on-field warm-ups? Then when the team leaves the field for their locker room before game time, do they want them to come back out on the field introduced together as a team? Some schools may only add the head coach to any introductions. Others may want coordinators added. Now, these are all things to look for when reviewing those scripts and timing sheets that you asked for ahead of time. Where does the national anthem fit in to the pregame program? Are both teams on the field or not? Does the marching band play an anthem? Are you announcing them or do they have their own announcer? What about a singer? If one is performing the anthem, get background information on them before you introduce them. Ask them questions like, are they an alum? What do they do for a living? 
Have they performed somewhere else before? Or have they won any awards? Are they local? Are they a current student on campus? Do they attend a local, public, or private elementary, middle, or high school? Again, these are all things to look for when introducing a performer for the National Anthem. And you can also check out our tutorial on the National Anthem for more detailed ideas. Phew, whew, the pregame's covered. You've connected with the athletics director or head coach at the high school level, or the marketing department and the team sports information director at the college level. You have your rosters and pronunciations figured out and you've rehearsed them. So now the easy part, calling the game itself. Now, I wanna make a point right away here. When it comes to being a public address announcer, we are just that. We report what happened. We are not play-by-play -play announcers and we are not color analysts. Now that's not to say that we don't use our voice to show a bit more enthusiasm when the home team gets a first down, an interception, a fumble recovery, a field goal, a touchdown, or a safety. We can do that. We should not, though, add any color commentary to our announcements. Now we have another video in this series about interacting with game officials. In there I talk about the number one pet peeve that game officials have with us, and that's when we add commentary to our announcements. Now, I attended a preseason football officials meeting in preparation for this video, and to a person, they all agree that commentary from us is just not appropriate. One official even quoted a situation where he threw a flag and the PA announcer, after saying what was called, added, fans, can you believe that call? Now again, that doesn't mean that we show a little more excitement when the home team does something well, we can and should use what I call respectful enthusiasm for our guests, but that's all, no commentary. I've said before that both teams practice all week. Both teams run and lift together and watch film, and that should be reflected in how we make our game announcements. What about getting to use a spotter? I've announced football both with and without a spotter. Now, a spotter does make things a lot easier. i found that setting up this relationship with a spotter so you as the announcer always look at the offense for both teams. The spotter is always looking at the defense. I feel that that's worked best. You may say that you want your spotter to also figure out yards gained or yards to go for down and distance. You can give them that responsibility as well. You are announcing who carried or caught the ball and for how many yards maybe, if that was your responsibility. All the time listening to what the spotter's telling you about who made the tackle, or if their responsibility is how many yards they gained, you're listening for that. You trust what they tell you, even if you think you saw it differently. That's their role, trust them to do their job. For example, for a play from scrimmage, you see the ball carrier and say, that's Rayom off the right side. Your spotter tells you the tackler, so you can immediately add, Brought down by Steenberg. You see the ball placement and know the previous line of scrimmage so you can finish with eight yards on the carry and a Raider first down if the yards were your responsibility. If the spotter's responsibility was the yards, you'd listen to what they would say. Or you might say something like, Langan's pass complete to Angelastro, 15 yards on the catch and run and a Hornet first down. Now here, you didn't hear me say who made the tackle, even if the spotter told me so. This could be if this offensive team runs a hurry-up offense. They try to keep the defense in their base defense. They get to the line of scrimmage immediately for the next play from scrimmage. If I were to say who made the tackle, I run the risk of talking while the quarterback is trying to hurry and call signals for the next play, and I never want to do that. So if you know you're announcing a game with a team that plays this way, they play a hurry-up offense, you'll need to learn right away that your announcements after each play need to be quick and they need to be economical. Instead of saying, Langan's pass, complete to Angel Astro, brought down by Jones, 15 yards on the catch and run, and a Hornet, first down. You may not have time to say that. So instead, you may have to paraphrase and say, Angel Astro on the catch and run for 15 yards and a first down for the Hornets. Or, Angel Astro with the reception, Jones on the stop, 15 yards, first down. 
The more you do this, the more you'll learn what's the most important things to say in that short period of time that you'll have between plays when a team plays this hurry up offense. Now here's a different example. An example of an opponent's fourth down play that stopped short of the line to gain and the defense now takes over on downs. You would say, Smith on the carry, stopped for no gain. Nager and Brognoli on the stop for the Tigers. The Tigers now take over on downs first and 10. First and 10 at their own nine yard line. How about a special teams play? Let's say a punt. You would say, Valentine in punt formation for the Bears. Deep to receive as a pair for West Hill, Adams, number 21, and Barnes, number 80. Now, how can you tell quickly how far the punt traveled? Well, here's a neat trick that I've learned to figure this out. As I'm announcing who is in punt formation ready to kick, I note where the line of scrimmage is. Then before the snap, I mark down how many yards it is to midfield. So if the line of scrimmage is the team's own 35-yard line, I note that it's 15 yards to midfield. Once the punt is in the air and crosses midfield, I then count off by five yards at a time how many yards it travels before it's caught. And I'll do this out loud, 5, 10, 15, 20, and so on. And I'll make a note of that. As an example, say the punt is caught at the returning team's 21-yard line. That's 29 yards from midfield. In this example, it's 15 yards to midfield for the punter, plus 29 yards into the receiver's territory equals 44 yards on the punt. Then as the returner runs the ball back, I count off the yards in those same five yard increments to add up the return. I'll count out loud to myself, five, 10, 15, and then three more yards and he was tackled. All right, that equals 18 yards on the return. After the returner is now tackled and the officials are spotting the ball, I can announce how many yards on the punt and how many yards on the return. 44 yards on the punt with 18 yards on the return for Jackson. And by that time, the ball's set. The chains are lined up and I can add to my announcement saying, the Raiders take over first and 10. First and 10 at their own 39 yard line. Now, if the punt never crosses midfield, I simply subtract the distance back from the 50 where the ball was caught and subtract that from my original number. So in our example, the line of scrimmage was their own 35 yard line. That's 15 yards to midfield. The punter shanked it and it went out of bounds at their own 48 yard line. That's 15 yards, the yards to midfield, minus two yards short of midfield equals 13 yards on the punt. Kickoffs are another time that you can highlight certain players for both teams. Now, remember those questions I said were good to ask of a coach or a sports information director as you were getting the rosters? Well, use that information to help you in this situation. As both teams are lining up for a kickoff, refer to your notes on who those returners were. Double check the numbers on the field to be sure that you have the correct players. Also, look who's getting the ball from the official to tee it up for the kickoff. You can come up with whatever you're comfortable with, but here's what I like to say. Deep is a pair to receive for Orchard Park, Smith, number 24, and Jones, number 29. Gogolak, number three, to do the honors for Ogdensburg Free Academy. Now, full disclosure here, I'm a Buffalo Bills fan. I was born and bred in Western New York. The play-by-play -play voice of the Bills when I was growing up was the late Van Miller, and I have to admit, I've used one of his calls when there are three returners deep for a kickoff. He would use the word triumvirate to describe those three returners as a group. So if there's ever three kickoff returners back to receive, I would say, deep as a triumvirate to receive for the Bulldogs is Byron Franklin, number 31, Alvin Wyatt, number 11, and Keith Moody, number 14. That's just my little shout out to any Bills fans that happen to be in the stands. A quick note about announcing down and distance after a play. Always wait until you see the official set the ball for play. Note what you see is the yard, the yard line the ball is on and calculate yards gained from the previous spot. But still, before announcing anything, wait for the person on the box. 
that post that has the down numbers on it to set up next to the linesman and show the number of the next down. Then you can safely announce the yards gained after the play, then the down and distance for the next first down. Now I say wait because I've seen times, and I'm sure many of you have seen the same thing, where the official sets the ball. The linesman with the chain crew along the sideline sets a different spot. Something gets adjusted, either the chains or the ball, before the next play. So if you see the chain set up for a second and nine and announce that, then the officials correct themselves before the snap to really show second and eight. You now have to go back and correct that first announcement. So it's always better to wait for the ball and the chains to be set to, and then see the official chop in the play clock before announcing down and distance. Now remember earlier how I said the connecting pregame with the officials is a good idea. In that conversation, mention how you as the PA announcer go off the box for down and distance and that you would ask them to move as quickly as they can so you don't disrupt the rhythm of the game. Now you should also add in this conversation when talking with them that you're asking because you as the announcer, you don't want to talk as the team gets to the line of scrimmage. You can add, you know, you understand this is a tough situation and it's tough to do sometimes, but you appreciate the fact that they're trying to go as quickly as possible. Now we all know, especially at the high school level, that these folks on the chain crews are usually volunteers. They only go by what the officials tell them to do, but again, you want to go off of them. So the quicker this all happens, the better. So when the officials hear you announce down and distance, right as soon as they set the chains and the ball, they start to see that you're on the same page with them and that you're on your A game tonight. Just like in basketball, you never want to be talking while someone's shooting a free throw. You never want to make an announcement while the quarterback is trying to call signals. Now we've touched on this a few times already, and you can see how important it is to get your pre-snap announcements done quickly. How about announcing a turnover? Interceptions are easy. You can see who picked off the pass. Get into the mindset that as soon as there is an interception, immediately jot down where they pick the ball off. Keep a running count. I do that out loud in five yard increments, just like I did on a kick return, of the yards on the interception return. This lets you go further than just saying, that's Josh Chester with the interception. Alden now takes over first and 10. First and 10 at their own 35 yard line. Instead, you can now say, that's Josh Chester on the interception for the Bulldogs. 20 yards on the return, out to the 35 yard line, where Alden will now take over, first and 10. Touchdowns are fun. Whether it's a kick return, a blocked punt, an interception, or a fumble return for a touchdown, or a play from scrimmage, we've already said it's okay to be more enthusiastic for the home team without sounding like a cheerleader as well as being respectfully enthusiastic for the guests. But be observant. Before saying anything, check the field for penalty flags. The last thing you want to do is to make a correction that a touch touchdown really doesn't count because there's a penalty on the team that scored. A good thing to think about when announcing a touchdown is to think about announcing it after the play is over and after the extra point. You can imagine a loud cheer, especially when the home team scores. The crowd probably is going wild and they won't be listening to your announcement anyways. So then if you wait until after the extra point, you can announce who scored, how long the catch of the run was for the touchdown, and who successfully kicked the extra point. Now the crowd has settled down a bit and is more likely to hear your announcement. Now remember earlier in this session when I talked about being respectful, yet at the same time being enthusiastic? Remember that we are reporters. We tell people what went on. We save the commentary for the columnists. So be careful that your announcement for a touchdown doesn't sound something like this. Can you believe that folks? That's Johnny Holmes breaking six tackles for a 40 yard Tiger touchdown. That puts Central High up 40 points, 40 zip. Instead, you can get the same essential information across and still be enthusiastic by saying, that's Johnny Holmes, 40 yards for a Tiger touchdown. 
you don't need to say that he broke six tackles. That's for the color commentator who's showing the instant replay. And remember about being respectful to your opponent. And you don't need to announce the score of a lopsided game. For me, when a team gets more than three touchdowns ahead, I stop announcing the score after each touchdown or field goal. Now, if that team gets back in the game and makes it closer than that, I'll go back to announcing the scores. How about a point after touchdown or a field goal? It's traditional to say who is on the kick for the extra point. Well, think about adding the holder and maybe even the long snapper to your announcement. Now, if you think about it, if neither of these players do their job well, the kicker doesn't stand a chance. So adding their names acknowledges their importance to the extra point or the field goal. The players will hear their names and know that you recognize their importance to the team. And it also educates the crowd as well. You would say something like, Paul Winicky on to attempt the conversion with a hold from Patrick Langan and the snap from Chris Nager. Now remember earlier when we talked about waiting until after the extra point to announce how the touchdown was scored? Though it's perfectly fine to announce the players involved in the extra point before they line up for the conversion. Then after the attempt, you can announce the touchdown score again and then repeat the result of the kick. It's just something else that you can get organized in your pre-game conversations with both teams. Now let's go back to that situation where a touchdown is scored, then called back due to a penalty. How do you best handle that? Well, because you waited and looked for the flag first before announcing the touchdown, it's simple. There's a flag on the play, nothing more. Then if the official is miked, well, that's easy. We stay out of the way and we don't say anything. Let them handle announcing the penalty. If the official is not miked, we should wait for the officials to administer the penalty. If they give a preliminary signal, do not announce it. When I've asked officials about this, they say that we shouldn't announce it. They cite situations where a call may get changed or overruled. So in this situation, it's always best to wait for the official to step off the penalty, then signal what it is before you make your announcement. Now at that point, after it's been stepped off and signaled, it's now safe for you to announce what the penalty was, how many yards it's for, and what the resulting down and distance is. It would sound something like this. Holding called against Mansfield, 10 yards from the line of scrimmage. The result of the penalty brings up a first down and 20. Now, it goes without saying that it is on us to know the officials' signals. You can find them at the NFHS website at ncaa.org and at our website at publicaddressannouncer.org. Some are easy. This is holding. This is a personal foul. What about when the official puts his hands on his hips? For high school, this is called encroachment, not offsides. In college, it's called offsides. It may be a small difference and you may think it's just semantics. But our job is to be correct. Uh, did you know about this one? Did you know this is for illegal participation? How about substitutions? Well, you could do it for basketball and probably get away with it in sports like field hockey, soccer, baseball, and softball. But it's impractical for football. Substitutions are often made in large groups based on down and distance, so it's best to just stay away from it. The exception is for a new quarterback. It's good to make this announcement if you notice when it happens. If you miss when they come in and realize it a few series later, it's probably best just to ignore it. Say there's a timeout. At the college level, timeouts are called for media at the first dead ball after the five minute mark of each quarter. Also, any team called timeout before the five minute mark automatically goes to a media timeout. That's television's time to show their commercials. When this happens, there's nothing wrong with saying either, we have a timeout on the field, or we have a timeout for media. Now you may see an official signal for a timeout, often for an injury. When you see this signal for a timeout, and then they touch their shoulders, it's just called an official's timeout. 
you make the simple announcement, officials, timeout. When a team calls timeout, wait for the official to signal for the timeout, then point to the team calling the timeout before you announce, saying something like, the Hornets call timeout. Let the official administer the timeout before you say anything, similar to letting the official administer a penalty before you announce anything. Again, I say wait because there have been times when you may think you see a coach frantically signal for a timeout, but then for some reason change their mind. Wait until you see the official signal for the timeout before you make any announcement. Now, I briefly touched earlier on halftime when I talked about whether you'd be asked to announce or MC a marching band or a halftime youth scrimmage. Another thing at the high school level that I've done that I've gotten some positive feedback about is reading scores from other teams at that school and when they play next. I do this both to inform the crowd at the football game of the other sports that that high school has in the fall and also to promote these teams and their efforts. High school football may be the sport at your school that has the biggest crowds, so look to adding these other games and their scores to your halftime scripts. The kids on these teams, they'll appreciate it, and maybe more people will come to watch those other games. What about those words that we never say out loud in the press box because we could jinx the game? Do you know the rules for overtime for high school and college football? Well, we should, mainly because many of the fans just don't know them. And at our core, our job is to inform the fans. For example, at the high school level, overtime play starts at the 20-yard line. A team on offense plays for first downs and they try to score. They play alternating series until there's a winner. The final score reflects the scores in overtime. At the college level, play in overtime starts at the 25-yard line. Each team plays one offensive and one defensive series. Like in high school, they play for first downs and then a score. If the game is still tied after those first two possessions, each team then runs alternating two-point plays instead of starting again at the 25-yard line. Again, the game is played until a winner is determined and the final score reflects the scores from overtime. What do you do if there's an injury? The answer is simple, nothing. No public address, no music. We just stay quiet. We need to stay out of the way. So medical personnel, the trainers, doctors, if an EMT is called to the field, they can easily communicate. When we talk or play music, we can only interfere with those conversations. When an injured player either walks off or is taken off, we still say nothing. The crowd will spontaneously applaud for the player, and that's fine. We stay quiet. We don't say that we're glad that they're back up or that we hope to see them back in the game real soon. We stay out of it. Again, if someone on the field needs to communicate somehow, we help that by staying quiet. Weather delays happen. A thunderstorm can pop out out of nowhere. The rule is that once thunder is heard or lightning is seen, the field is cleared and the game is delayed for 30 minutes. And it's 30 minutes for every subsequent instance of thunder or lightning. So if it's been 25 minutes since the last rumble of thunder and another one is heard, that 30 minute clock restarts. As frustrating as that can be at times, safety always has to be number one. This is a situation where you need to have a script ready, telling spectators where to go. Where is that predetermined safe place on your campus? Now this is something good to ask about pre-season, not pre-game. In many instances, especially at the high school and at some college campuses, it may be just as simple as getting everybody back to their vehicles and off those aluminum bleachers. If you're in a bigger stadium, is the concourse of that stadium you're working in adequate for large crowds? We, as the public address announcer, aren't picking the spots to go, but we need to have a script prepared specific to that stadium or to that field where the game is being played. If it's the high school level, the athletics director is your go-to person for this. If it's college, go through the marketing department to see what's been planned out ahead of time. 
Many universities may show video during pregame of the steps to follow in an emergency specific to that facility. You need to be ready to have an announcement ready to go that calmly reminds fans of this procedure. Now in my notebook with all my rosters and stat sheets that I have for every game, I also have pre-made emergency type scripts that I could use if they're ever needed. I try to think of every possible scenario. Now you hope you never have to use them, but it's best to be prepared. For example, what's in place if there's a power outage? Or heaven forbid, a person with a weapon? Again, we don't make these decisions, but we need to be ready to calmly communicate these procedures that have been thought out ahead of time and announce them to the fans in attendance. I've alluded to how I use my voice in different spots throughout this tutorial. And throughout, I always try to follow some basic rules. Number one, if you're not sure, don't guess. Number two, less is more. And number three, use respectful enthusiasm. Now the example I gave earlier about who recovered a fumble or whether a ball carrier made the line to gain for a first down or not, wait for the official to do their job, then we go off their signal and never before that. We've covered that already. It's always fine to add a bit more excitement to your voice for the home team's first down, for their interception or a home team touchdown. Just stick to what happened. Remember, no color commentary. Leave that to the play-by-play -play teams in the next booth. Remember, less is always more. Now, we've probably all seen the places that had that big old bell slowly making that deep gong, gong, when the visiting team has a third down. And you've heard a PA announcer join in with third down. Well, it's fine, I think, if you want to wait that third down call a bit. I just found that listening to a long drawn out third down over and over and over again loses its effectiveness for me. For me, I prefer to keep it short, saying, that brings up a third down and 10. Our guests for that game, they practice, they lift, they run, they watch film just like the home team. They've earned that respectful enthusiasm from me, and I'll give a little more of it when the home team gets a first down. Connolly carries for six yards out to the 40 yard line for a Hornet first down but I'll use my voice to acknowledge that same thing for our guests in that same game. Jones on the reception, 12 yards on the catch and run, out to the 36 yard line, and a Wildcat, first down. Now you can hear my enthusiasm for that Hornet first down and it came right through, but I was also respectfully enthusiastic for the visiting team as well. Let's move to post game now. Once the game ends, are you expected to read final statistics? Well, I guess this should be added to your list of things to check on pregame. Now, you shouldn't try to tally those statistics yourself during the game. You've got enough to do as it is. But if this is expected of you, find out who's providing you that information. As for closing the event, I finish with the final score. If it's lopsided, as I said earlier, more than three touchdowns, I just won't announce that final score, especially for a high school game, out of respect for the losing team. They know they got beat pretty bad. They don't need me announcing the final score again. Sticking with high school, I add the next game for both teams in my post-game announcements, where and when it is, with something that sounds like this. Whether you're a fan of the Wildcats and travel to Baldwinsville next Friday for a seven o'clock kickoff with the Bees, or you are a fan of the Hornets and are right back here next Friday for a 7 o'clock start with Auburn. We like to remind you that both the Town of Manlius Police and the FM School District ask that you please buckle up and enjoy a safe trip home. For a college game, it's similar, but I just announced the home team's next game, time and location. If it's a road game, I also add how our fans can tune in. Is it televised somewhere? Is it streamed online? Or is it just available on the radio? Then I'll announce their next home game, date and time and how they can get their tickets. You see, I wanna help create a situation where fans can stay connected to the team when they're on the road, as well as when they're home. I finish again by saying that all of us here are associated with, insert college name here, athletics, 
ask that you buckle up and enjoy a safe trip home because we're all looking forward to seeing you right back here on next home day's date and time as the Raiders take on the Lehigh Mountain Hawks right here at Andy Kerr Stadium. And wherever you go, if it's a game for Colgate, and wherever you go, go Gate! And if it's a game for Syracuse, and wherever you go, go Orange! So I hope this has helped you feel a little more comfortable about announcing high school or college football. Please send any constructive comments to me at my email address here on the screen. And don't forget to check out our website, publicaddressannouncer.org, for more handy tips and resources. Thanks for watching Announcing the Game. I'm Tom Winicky, and I hope to hear you on the mic. <laughs>